Andy out of her lap, sending her spilling clumsily onto the floor. Sarah Beth returns to her crossword and whiskey, tapping the side of the mug three times, always three, and Andy crawls back towards the TV where her art supplies are waiting. This is the longest conversation about Susanna that they will ever have. When Andy was growing up, Sarah Beth was a bookkeeper to the only contractor in town, a red-faced man in his 50s named Bill Jeffries. Bill and Sarah Beth seemed cut from the same cloth. Both gruff, no-nonsense, and generally taciturn, they maintained a code of mutually assured silence that permeated the business. Builders, clients, architects, anyone who walked through the doors instinctively lowered their voice to maintain the unspoken expectation of quiet, as though walking through a museum. In many ways, museum was a good descriptor of the Jeffries Build Service office. Framed project drawings and photographs of completed bills lined the wood panel halls, but the majority of Bill's collection was more magpie-like in nature. Pilfer keepsakes sat on shelves atop filing cabinets. Bits of wood pockmarked with rot, jade lengths of oxidized copper, jars of tile fragments, their colors muted with age. Sarah Beth's feverish dusting kept the sticky dust accumulation of older buildings at bay, but Bill outright refused her attempts to polish them. He insisted it would deprive them of their character, so they remained, a tarnished and aged set of artifacts that gleam under the fluorescent lights. Andy was a frequent fixture in the office. She read in the corner of the lobby when Bill or her mother were busy and scribbled on the floor by one of their desks when they were not. As she got older, she began to hover quietly in meetings. She designed extravagant dream homes with a stolen compass and protractor and showed them proudly to Bill, who patiently reviewed and critiqued them. Long before she graduated high school, she had decided she wanted to be an architect. When Andy left for Syracuse, Bill presented her with a framed copy of a sketch she had saved from her early childhood a towering castle with water slides spiraling into the surrounding moat to hang in her dorm. In the bottom corner, he had written, Remember to save me a room, Bill. The drawing came with Andy to her first apartment. It was a tiny studio, just large enough for a bed and a drafting table. She had chosen the place for the smell. The unit itself was, to, was located directly next to the laundry room and directly above the communal courtyard, which meant that it smelled at all times like detergent and cigarettes. It reminded her of home. There was a small Italian place a few blocks away where she started waiting tables for extra cash. That was where she met Dan. Dan was the head cook at the restaurant, which meant that he was the only one reliably sober, sober enough to get the produce order in on time. He had a thick mop of sandy hair, a small gap between his front teeth, and a shitty tattoo of Animal from The Muppet Show on his left forearm. The other women who worked there, a gaggle of other college girls and one beleaguered older woman named Steph, were all enamored with him. Andy thought he was ridiculous. Her first week, Bitter cold, sidewalks choked with snow. He offered to drive her home, and reluctantly she agreed. He drove her home every day for two months before she allowed him to come home with her. Dan referred to that apartment as the war room because he said entering always felt like walking in on a general preparing for battle. The half-empty bottle of whiskey on the desk, the array of blueprints and drawings scattered across every surface, the overflowing ashtray, and the overall nature of the room itself, spartan and without decoration. Except for Bill's castle, her castle really, suspended by a single nail above the bed. His first night in her apartment, Andy came out of the bathroom to find him kneeling on the bed, tracing Bill's clumsy handwriting with his finger. Remember to save me a room. So, he said when he saw her standing in the doorway. So, she said, so save me one too. He smiled a gap to smile and reached out his hand. Andy's mother is sitting at her desk at the office, pouring whiskey from a plastic bottle into a paper cone cup from the water cooler and drinking it. Andy asked her why she was bothering with a cup if she can't even set it down. She says it's the routine of it. On her desk is a photograph of three girls. The girl in the middle has her arms around the shoulders of the other two. Their faces are fuzzy, but Andy is sure somehow that they must be smiling. Do you remember? Her mother asks. Do I remember what? She replies. Being young. Sometimes. Do you remember? I remember everything, her mother says. My mom said I was a smart cookie. And then she smiles so wide that Andy remembers that it's a dream. Her mother takes a gulp of whiskey and refills the cup. It's dark outside the office window. The dust lamp turns her mother to gold. The whiskey turns to honey. Her mother turns the jar over in her hand and it catches the light like a match flare. Did you know honey never spoils? Her mother asks as the amber liquid unspools from the jar and spills across the desktop. Yes. Do you know why? I don't know. Just one of those things, I guess. Her mother looks right at her and cocks her head to one side. Just one of those things. The story went that Sarah Beth met Andy's father in a car crash. When pressed, Sarah Beth would say that this was a good metaphor for the relationship as a whole, and that it came out of nowhere and it was all his fault. 
Andy's father had merely T-boned Sarah Beth at an intersection outside of town, hitting the tail of her car with enough force to send her spinning off the road into a tree. The car was totaled, but she walked away largely unscathed, save for two cracked ribs and a black eye, and carrying the insurance information of the stranger who had hit her scribbled on a ripped corner of a New York State road map. In reality, Andy's father hadn't meant to end up in Broken Lake at all. Desperately lost on his way to visit a cousin in Vermont, he had had the map spread across the dashboard and was attempting to find his way back to the highway when he crashed into her mother. With the hood of his car crumpled like a napkin, he checked himself into a motel to wait out for repairs and nurse's newly fractured ribs. And invited her to join him at the bar across the road from where he was staying so that he could buy her a drink as an apology. The body shop told him that it would take six days for the car to be drivable again. He stayed another six months, living out of the same motel room and packing up odd jobs in town to pay the weekly rate. Every moment of spare time he had, he and Sarah Beth spent together. The relationship itself caused by stir. Sarah Beth Holland, greedy and reserved, never quite the same since the disappearance of her far more popular older sister, suddenly on the arm of a mysterious stranger from out of state. Sarah Beth, never one for embellishment, did not describe this at the time as others might have. Their romance, by her description, was neither magical nor a whirlwind. They were simply together until they were not. She became pregnant with Andy about a month after they, they began seeing each other. It was a surprise, but not an unhappy one, despite their having known each other so short a time. They were excited by Sarah Beth's telling to start a life together, or at least she was and he appeared to be. They didn't tell anyone about the pregnancy, but began quietly putting money away. She made up excuses for the morning sickness, she quit her job at the supermarket and began working for Bill, figuring that a job that allowed her to sit shut up in an office and behind a desk would allow her to hide the bump longer. She was just starting to show when Andy's father left. After making several phone calls to friends from college, he told her that he had lined up a job interview with an electrical company in New Hampshire. He picked up his suitcase, kissed her on the cheek, and assured her that he would return in a few days. He left her Ever a phone number to call in case of emergencies. By the end of the week, she started to worry. Day after day, she drove by the motel, but his car had not reappeared in the lot. She called the number he left behind, only to find it was out of service. With his clothes and his car gone, she realized with grim certainty that he too was gone for good. She never returned to the motel. Andy's father was never seen or heard from again. The story of Sarah Beth Holland and the disappearing lover was often revisited when gossip was scarce. Where collective memory grew hazy, details were invented and then mythologized. There had never been a car crash, some said. Sarah Beth had been hitchhiking out of town in search for her sister and gotten cold feet. Andy's father had been married. Andy's father had been a minister. Andy's father had raped Sarah Beth and ran when she threatened to call the police. Sarah Beth's abandonment haunted her like a ghost in the speculations of her neighbors and acquaintances, and she withdrew further and further from them all, into work and into Andy, and ultimately into a bottle, which only made things worse. The whispering intensified until nobody bothered to whisper anymore. When she was growing up, friends' mothers often asked Andy, in the hushed tones of false sincerity, if they had ever heard from her father. They asked how everything was at home, which Andy learned early on meant, is she still drinking? And Andy would reply, they're fine, which they learned, that, which they learned meant, of course, that she was. This was the reality of Andy's childhood, and she accepted it without much thought. She was aware, vaguely, that other families were different. Other families had fathers and more siblings and less death. But these things didn't really trouble her, and in the self-absorbed self nature of many children, it wouldn't occur to her until many years later that her own family was any less than normal. So she and her mother continued to float through their private universe as binary stars, orbiting each other in the immense loneliness and quiet dark of space, and as far as Andy ever knew, they were happy. Yeah. <laughs> So how close is this novel to them? Uh, like, I don't know, like, I would say What's your page a little less than half. What's your page count? Pretty good. Per, like, on a Google document, like, 55. So, I don't know what that translates to. I don't know what that translates to into, like, book. <laughs> yeah, so format. that excerpt, was it, like, throughout? Yeah, so they were, these, they were, continuous, these right? were not continuous. So no. I wanted to choose things that would that would make sense in the context of the larger story but that also would work in isolation which is what you've done in your submissions right as well yeah yeah so and there's other pieces of it that we've published mm -hmm. and like kind of forming a they have won yeah. seasonal awards yeah.
from us. Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's kind of a there is an overarching narrative, but it does it jumps back and forth between the like present and memory and kind of dream, and as it gets you know mm-hmm. further into the further into the the storyline, it kind of the it starts to blur a little bit where which is which. Um, so I'm, I'm a little less than halfway done. I like literally maybe a day ago finished writing the like got to the kind of the beginning of like the actual real like yeah plot. the core the core of it the yeah core of it, I guess. yeah not the real plot but, but you know the transformation of the yeah yeah yeah. Keep going. Thanks. Yeah, we all want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> is, it end up, is it really about the relationship between the mother and the daughter, or is the there? So what you read doesn't even mention the cult. Yeah, I didn't even mention. That. So there's the. It's about the. It, it's in large part about the relationship between the the mother and the daughter, but it's more about the. Um, the like it mentions in these particular excerpts that there is a um, that the the mother's sister disappears and kind of yeah. the the way that the that grief transforms mm-hmm. the mother and then the relationship there mm-hmm. and how that kind of um, the way like the the grief and the parallels of like with the conflict of moving back to this well I think it also must be said that the mother's dead from the beginning of the book right the mother the like the mother is dead from the, like she's, yeah she's, she's not like, there yeah she's yeah not, um yeah <laughs> but it's uh it kind of the the way that 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 grief and the the way that that um the grief of that relationship sort of parallels with the conflict of moving back to this town that is going through a lot of conflict in and of itself with mm-hmm. the kind of uh, arrival and growth of this like very contentious cult community. Oh, um, okay, you're saying cult. I, for some reason, I was picturing a baby horse. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, cults. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the hot topic of young horses. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Jersey <laughs> Devil Horse. Yeah. yeah, no, I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's real fucking. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, not horses. You really just horses. Horses also very, very much out of my mind. Yeah. 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 Ye
like there's all I'm like oh, like there's there's just these images like popping up off of it. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I, I really it's not heavy handed. Yeah, no, no, but there's a lot there. You know what I mean? Like there's like yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like not it's not sparse, but it's like dry. Yeah. Like not dry, like content-wise. Yeah. Like the, no, the I know what you mean. Yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I try really hard to be very intentional with the way that I like describe the world because I visualize it very clearly mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that I'm able to convey that without like you know yeah. what's the what's the saying the uh, like four pages on a door or something like that you know you write an entire page on a door is that like I feel like that's something I learned I want to learn that one. Not a page that sounds, sounds, yeah. Totally yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like a good one, like whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for. Uh, yeah, I love it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It was lovely. Good luck. Still finish it in November, right? Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get right on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I could read a few things that I was planning on reading. Please. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Maybe you want to switch spots, maybe? Yeah. There he's got all Yeah. Guys, this is our friend Jonah, too, by the way. This is Rachel and Jared. Yep. Well, nice to meet you. I think I've conversed with you before. Are you some type of uh, elected official around here? I guess so, yeah. So yeah. They tell, so they tell me. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Are you Angie and Tito Bar? I am, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for coming to uh, the uh, uh, wine store here. Oh, my pleasure. I appreciate the company. I don't know if you're looking for something. We're really, uh, we're really happy to be here. Or we have sparkling water. and. I'm all set for now. Thank you. So like you said, I'm just going to read a few of the things I was going to read because some of them are a little, one of them was kind of submersive and I needed an audience where I couldn't look at every one of the eyes, but I had this whole bit planned and I'm not going to do it. All right. And so uh, let me just, since you in I'm introduced Rachel, let me just do a little, just a brief, you know, so, so Jared, uh, when we first started Monadnock Underground, um, almost so, so Jared's first piece ran four years ago. Um, we're, we're almost approaching our, our, like four, more than four and a half years old at this point, Jeez. right? So somehow early on, and, and I always say, I have no idea what happened, but I think it might have been a Facebook ad. I don't know how you found us. Is that what it was? Facebook? I joined a bunch of groups for submissions because I had written a rash of short fiction, 600 to 1,000 word things in like a three month span. I was like, maybe I will submit it, but, but like I never do. And then, like, I cultivated a list, and I guess you guys had been, like, an ad. At we did. Yeah, we did. Something. We ran some and ads, said, yeah. It, in conjunction with, like, 40 other ones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of other people were like, you know, sir, like, please like, don't contact us. Again. <laughs> yeah. And you're well, like, well, here, I'm going to publish it. Like, all right. So, you know, what happened with us was this was at a stage when um, – um, we were really kind of building that writer writer base, and we were shocked at that point in time at how many submissions we ended up getting um, from all around um, and from from strangers. Because uh, Jared's not a friend of a friend. We he's not from around here. He's come up from Atlantic City. You were in Philly at the time, I think. Oh, yeah, South Philly at the time. Um, yeah. You know, so no no connection whatsoever. And this this happened in a few cases. Um, he's he's continued to write for us. He's he's been published in at least three of the collections, maybe four. B both of the magazine ones and then the sci-fi collection. Yep, with Thanos. Um, yep. Uh, but so the first piece comes in, and it's um, this Rick piece, Derringer. Rick Derringer and, you and Grandma. Your library. That's that's true. Yes, you you have. We, we had a we had a during COVID we had a, a book release um, online with the library, and um, he he had a, a very vibrant appearance. It was his birthday. Him what he wanted to do for his birthday, and he was like, I want you to find a way to make me into Thanos so that I can nice. do this thing. And I was like, uh, And, was like, and okay. you did, he and did you it. did. Um, but and yeah, the, 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 this, the, this they gave first me pres piece. checking out some prosciutto, like they off the back of the truck, like, Who wants these prosciutto? It's this Christmas, and they're throwing these 800. I'm like, Oh. Yeah. And then I could slice it because you can't just slice the prosciutto. Yeah, right. No, you can't. No, yeah. You need a slicer. Yeah, yeah. I take it to Grace Ferry Community Center. Yeah. Yeah. Rickety ass. Then we slice the machine. I was like, slice me out. We had like five, ten pound bags of this prosciutto. And it was a really shitty meat slicer, too. So we had like. Yeah. Like slabs. Thank you. Cooked with it. We made a bunch of stock out of it, which was divine. Yeah, but it's great. 
Anyway. But like, yeah, like so. No, no, it's all, no, it's all good. This is all important color. Like so, th- this 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 first this first piece comes in, and um, you know, the the way that we do things is um, when when we have submissions open, I will re- review the submission emails and I'll I'll like approve or den- like give an approval or a denial, and then it goes to Zoe. She can also veto it if she really doesn't like it, but she's the, she's then the editor, and then she she has it I from there. She the. Sometimes she does not think I'm selective enough, um, especially with poems. Mostly with poems. I'm actually meaner than him, which no one. It's and that is that is the funniest thing is that she is actually meaner than I am. But um, it's usually with poems that you really complain because I have I have been a little bit too loose. But so this piece comes in, and this is one of maybe like two or three times I've had to do this. But I I read this piece, and I was just like, you know. I was like, you you got to look at this because this is nuts, but I think that there's something there and you have to tell me if I'm crazy or am I imagining that there's something there? And she read it and she's like, definitely something there. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, right on. Uh, you know, I'm not nuts. And, and that's how it's been. You know, Jared has a very unique style and a, and a unique presentation. And he's kind of developed a, a very casual, you know, a bit of a following on, you know, everyone recognizes his name, kind of, who's familiar with Monadnock Underground. And, um, like I said, yeah, three publications, a, a cameo appearance on a library Zoom <laughs> event. Is um, it recorded, though? Is that true? It's, uh, I'm... I was very worried. I was hovering over the... I might have been. You recorded it? Because I, I wasn't sure. Was it might be somewhere. <laughs> no, that's fair. And that's Jared, fair. Jared has the being the only that's very fair piece reaction. that has ever garnered a complaint. Mm-hmm. Yes. Where I was like, I was like confronted by someone who was like... It was not a reasonable complaint, but yes. It's not, but it, I was it confronted is the only by someone like, is... I can't believe you're publishing this and you better not be reading it to your children. And I've had unreasonable editing requests from other magazines. Yeah, like unreasonable ones. So, they were crazy. The, I do want to say that in the spirit of added context, Please. the night that Jared and I met, we met at a bar. And Jared had me read Rick Derringer and Grandma the night that we <laughs> Nice. Had. Way to go. Well, because I like that. Was like, she was writing. I was writing at the mm-hmm. bar. And the room. I was oh, okay. bartending across. I was bartending through his tattoo, and I came by because I saw my man Tommy bartending. And his, um, aunt, his aunt was Meredith on the office, this guy Tommy. Oh, no kidding? <laughs> really? <laughs> no shit. <laughs> That's really funny. So <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were making, like, we were making fun of him because he looks like Meredith from the office. Okay. And just had a baby, and the baby looked like Meredith from The Office. And we were like, "That's a fucked up looking baby." Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> 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 I'm sure she'll grow into it. Uh, <laughs> but we were so we were talking, and he was like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "I'm writing poetry." Because usually, when you tell a man that you're writing poetry at the bar, then you do alone. You're like, weird. I don't know how to handle that. Uh, <laughs> right. And he was like, "Oh." Donica Kelly, and he said, that's cool. I'm really trying to get more into the modern canon, but I always go back to the early beat work. And I know everybody loves that one E.E. E. Cummings love poem, but I like his more short right, story. Right, enough. But <laughs> I, like, I like this. But that's, that's, how, we, so good. that's how we, like, Yeah, yeah. Like Rick Derringer and Grandma has started, started a lot you did. of relationships. Well, that's not anything I'm interested in. That's, uh, in well, that's okay. inaccurate. She's wrong. Let me say those things. I like it. What did you think of it, though? I was like, this is very... I really liked it. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, you know, it it grabs you, right? Yeah, yeah. You did. You talked to me about it. I mean, it might have been a lie. No way. Maybe. It might have been a lie. It obviously worked. It worked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Either way. Yeah. That was an amazing intro. Let's see. It was. Yes. I'm ready. This one is a new one that has not been published. It's called Springtime. One time I saw a hawk eating a seagull. I was driving with a girl. We were maneuvering through an interminable parking lot in winter. I slammed on my brakes a few yards from this tremendous hawk. In its claws were the shredded remains of the seagull. The seabird's distended head lolled around like a marionette puppet as the hawk tore into its neck. The girl covered her eyes and whispered, Oh my God. The hawk and I made eye contact, and after several breathless moments, time and space were suspended under its searing gaze. This memory comes to me absently in archaic abstraction as I walk down to the seaport. 
goals call their call, some question marks thrown in at the end. I ask an old man huddled by a burning barrel fire if he knows what day the supply ship is coming. He says, ah shit, that's gypsy business, son, leave me alone. A cigarette hangs precipitously on top of my ear, or so I think. I reach for it and it's gone. My body is unbalanced. Can't even tuck a smoke behind my ear without it falling into the miasma. Nightcaps prowl around the cargo container alleyways. Dockmaster is a three foot tall dwarf named Biloxi. I hear him before I see him. A hacking cough and a violent curse to rest, directed up towards the anemic sky. The Dockmaster hears my plight. He sympathizes with me, sympathizes with me, but he smiles wryly and tells me that none of my trade offers will afford me the medicine I seek. Cruel and unusual pornography is his asking price, but I possess none. Uh, I'm going to redact the next two lines here. I barred as a taste of the thin, bitter tomato soup. My girl didn't even finish her share, just chain smoked her way through the crippling hunger pains and told me she hates tomato soup. We really didn't need that in hindsight. We really need tonight shit, though. I really need it. So sorry to say my body is in full nuclear winter. winter. I don't hold on to the past. Cast aside these mind traps from before. The future isn't looking too great either, as the chromatic sunrise makes its sickly appearance in the aluminum sky above all this. Billowing trash, fire, trash barrel fires dot the horizon across the river. I gaze upon the neighboring urban melt scene. The crappy putrescence. The cityscape bleeds its, black, its blackish heart blood into the oily water, pukes its sordid history into stagnant marshland with skeletal trees rattling in the sour wind, begs for impossible atonement to the closed ears of its dead generations. I return home empty-handed, nothing for the lady tonight. Uh, she moans her dope-sick nowhere prayers into the stained couch cushion. Face down, she does not hear me enter our squalid room does not hear me root around under the bed for my shoebox full of empty glassine bags. I step into the bathroom like a phantom and scrape them with a razor until a sizable pile accumulates on the porcelain vanity. Into the last good vein in the tormented arm, I look out the window and fade into the rooftops. I am made fluid with raindrops, flood sirens, change my heartbeats into neon transmission. Do my feet dangle over the edge of eternity as the cracked tiles on the kitchen floor morph into a mortal universe. Tomorrow will come now. I wake up and I know that it is so. Vivian is still on the couch. Her eyes are bloodshot and watery. She barely acknowledges me when I say I'm heading out to try to grab us something. Just offers a choke sob and a soft pleading chant that sounds like please, 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 please. Drag shrieking into the light of day. Springtime in all her Dracula dresses. And this one is called Hearing Loss. Back then, there were all kinds of empty cavernous bars like bowling alley lounges dotting the coastline before the teardowns. The best was the super lanes when it still felt like a sophisticated degenerate lounge around these parts. Rung out oil town of a boardwalk necked city juicing me with its drunken acid tinge whirly bird carnival thrills. Sprinting madcap atop a map of vice swaying dizzily between upscale cocktail joint and desolate sacred dope set. Dying all over town every night. Being reborn upon the waves a few miles up on Darlington Ave, jolly. Maybe in some wave at the pump house off Roosevelt. Paddling out in tropical storm washing machine shit at Bradley Beach with the Osaka sushi people's kids in their neon wetsuits bright as pickled ginger. Winter sleigh rides, swells, crashing bright hearted and merry like Beach Boy Christmas carols. A frame, God crafted, head high, cup hand formed from liquid and brine. Gliding on them and through them and with them in the glorious ocean dance of December on a six-foot stark white fishtail missile. But I digress. Years and years pass from the deep end of the public pool lurking like a shark. A wealth of seriously life-changing music performances in those times. I was witness to that which is the profane and sacrosanct. What? I mean, when it's hitting like that, like when a band, let's say Tarnished Vision, is vivisecting their way through a set and the place is just a death cage, I would achieve the most painful and beautiful and finite clarity car crash in suspended motion, ice pick in the brain, vocalist doing the bulldog brotherhood call to arms thing, chomping around the perimeter on a leash made of cast iron, guitarist channeling blacksmith hammer strikes, clang clang katana clean limb removal, jungle assault on the drum kit, the boys in the pit hitting each other like men overjoyed and crazed after being pulled from a mine after a fetid month, seeing the sun as if for the first time. Nothing like, like that demonic piano player down in Baltimore, though. This absurd harbinger of biblical end times made melodious. Seated at the piano, 
laying down the brimstone boogie, yeah, at a dueling piano bar in Bells Point. We were shambling around town in a stupor, and we ended up bearing witness to a young Lucifer incarnate upon the keys, just brutalizing his opponent as much as a piano duel can accomplish brutality. Johnny Cash said, I've been everywhere, man. I've been nowhere at least a dozen times, and it gets darker each trip around the black hole. I brought this guy up for a fucking reason. Just you wait. Piano man, not Johnny Cash. Uh, simple minds don't give a fuck that I met Devil Bell's Point, but I did. I met him. Hell is real, and I can promise this. But listen, I was told that in order to love myself, self-esteem must be sought through estimable, estimable actions to live a life replete with principles complementary to self-esteem. Fuck, I remember about 15 years ago getting kicked out of somewhere on St. Patrick's Day, being carried by the world's largest bouncer, and I couldn't even imagine self-esteem as something to have, something to achieve through action. Action, rather than thought, couldn't even begin. And that ends that one. Yes. And I'm not going to read Pinky Swear, because I was going to. And then I was going to read Workplace Masturbation, something that I wrote, and I'm not going to read that to you people here tonight. And then after... This almost gets after that was introduced over, every time. I was going to read a poem called... <laughs> <laughs> you think to be reject workplace masturbation? Yeah, also, I really liked it, but I would, but it's I really, understand why we couldn't publish it. It's too much. It was that much. It was yeah. Seriously, it was actually it was actually too much for even it's us. Too much. But I was yeah. gonna read that, <laughs> and then I was gonna like, you know, stop. I was gonna be real kind of confrontational and aggressive when I read it, and just kind of like deadpan and like stare at people. <laughs> and then I was gonna say, and this is penguins. Uh, a penguin waddling upon an iceberg, adorable seabird, and second one, and then a third, penguins, funny little seafaring guy, tuxedo-like spy, flap those wings but cannot fly, penguins, heart so full, watch penguins swim, working those fins, catching fish with a grin, penguins. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Much appreciated. Much appreciated.